Guitar Villains is brought to you by American Musical Supply. Just visit AmericanMusical.com for your unique coupon code. This is just for listeners of Guitar Villains. Anything you need, whether it's picks, guitar strings, cables, a capo, all those small little accessories, all the way up to the big stuff like a new guitar, an amp, all the gear you could ever want is at American Musical Supply. They also have no interest financing, so you can play now, pay later. Use the link in the description for your coupon code to use on your next gear purchase. Thanks to American Musical Supply for sponsoring Guitar Villains. Now let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to Guitar Villains Season 2, Episode 9, the penultimate episode. Today's guest is Grammy-winning artist Annie Clark, a.k.a. St. Vincent. This episode is packed with useful information like tips on songwriting, how to get that guitar tone, why a guitar should sometimes not sound like a guitar, and also some juicy nuggets like how Annie feels about Berklee College of Music. It was a great conversation, Annie was super fun to talk to, and I hope you enjoy this episode of Guitar Villains. Annie Clark. Welcome to Guitar Villains, the show where we deconstruct and decode the guitar. And Annie, I learned while I was doing a little homework for our conversation that you went to Berklee College of Music, and in your words, you went there for a hot minute. And then you say you basically went on to go on tour with Sufjan Stevens and go on to form your own band and make records, all the while your parents were thinking you were still at Berklee. And I assume they're happy with how your decision played out? Um, <laughs> yeah, it sort of happened like that. I was at Berkeley for a f- uh, couple years, a few years. I'm not exactly sure. It's a little bit of a blur. Um, and not because I was having fun, just because of <laughs> I blocked it out. But, um, and then I, uh, yeah, my parents thought I graduated and um, they only kind of found out that I didn't in uh when I was doing press for my first record I think and I was like yeah well I never I never graduated um and of course you know my mom would read those interviews and what what happened but so yeah I didn't I didn't graduate um and there is people do talk about a Berkeley curse like if you graduate from Berkeley you are destined to never make it in the music industry i mean that's just this is folklore who knows but um i graduated from berkeley so (laughs) oh jesus Uh, i i think i i'm i don't i'm no annie clark but it definitely uh that i was gonna i was gonna mention no no offense taken trust me it's funny because i'm so sorry no 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 you've made it you're doing great (laughs) i'm doing okay i'm talking to you right you're fine yeah all, all I can ask for is all these guitars. Um, I, it's really the only place I can think of where it's completely normal for people to attend for a short time and use it as kind of a jumping point for their next move musically. I have friends who took your path and others who graduated. It's an interesting industry that we find ourselves in. It is. In. And, and it's not true that people who graduate don't make it. There are lots of examples of great musicians who made it all the way through. But no, my, my mom actually still will bring it up every once in a while and go, are you sure you don't want to go back to college and get your degree? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm good. I think if I was going to go back to college, I would study art history and not, <laughs> you know, literature or something and not um, ear training. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So St. Saint Vincent is your stage name, your band name, which for the longest time I just thought it was your actual name. You know how sometimes you get to know somebody by their moniker, uh, but in case people missed it, your name is Annie Clark. St. Vincent. My name's Annie. Annie. Uh, middle name of your great, great grandmother. Do I have that right? Is that word? No, um, no, that was, I think that was early on when I was trying to figure out um, how to explain why I chose the name. Um, and I chose the name because it's it's a reference to a Nick Cave song, and it's a reference to Nick Cave making a reference to a Dylan Thomas, to where Dylan Thomas died. 
So I, I thought that that originally, especially in the early days when you're figuring out how, what even press is and how to do it and what to say, um, I thought that that story would sound a little too macabre. So I was like, oh, it's a grandmother's name. It's a this, it's that. But no, it's, it's a Nick Cave reference. Excuse me one second. I'm going to turn the AC off. Um, I'm surrounded by hot gear, so but I also have a, a, an AC that is precludes me from being able to hear the low end of anything. So it's all it's always a dance of like the the right temperature to kind of counteract the hotness of all of this tube electronics around me. I know so. the feeling, yeah, and keeping your guitars in tune is always just a fun chore. Well, not if you have the St. Vincent <laughs> Music Man model. <laughs> oh, you mean this one? <laughs> oh, that guy. Oh, my goodness. Yes, here it is. We're going to talk about this for sure. No, I'm, I, that was a shameless, silly plug. I'm, Trust me. People... Is that a gaming chair? Yes. Is that more common? Because I'm, I got to figure out, a ch I'm sorry that all these guitar players are so bummed, but <laughs> no. the proper chair a proper chair for your studio is super crush. And I cheaped out and bought some like Eames knockoff and I'm my lower back is paying the price for it, but it seems like a gaming chair might be the way to go. Yes. This is by secret lab. I highly recommend it. And let me, you said this is crucial. Let me show you what's actually crucial. You see this? <gasps> Lumbar support. This is called a spine. This is called a spine deck. Oh, and it makes you sit up look straight. Look at that. Uh, highly recommend it. They're only like 25, 30 bucks on Amazon. I think they might have just really? sold out now. <laughs> it's my secret. That's my that's my next purchase. That's what literally everyone says when I show it to them. I need to get like an affiliate link with them or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So the show is called Guitar okay. Villains because I think villains are just as cool, if not cooler, than heroes. Guitar heroes, guitar villains. I've always found villains are a little deeper and more memorable. So first thing I want to ask... I agree. You agree. Okay, so the first thing I want to ask is, out of all the movie or comic book villains out there, who would you say you identify with the most? And this is obviously not their villainous tendencies, but sometimes you can agree with what villains are up to. Is there anybody, whether it's like an appearance or character trait you share with them anybody mm -hmm. pop to mind oh man um oh geez let me let me think on this if you, um, if you want i i can give you my answer for which villain i think yeah like. please please so i think your super villain alter ego is the evil queen from snow white and the seven dwarfs or cruella Deville oh. from 101 dalmatians and let me tell you why so oh. the evil queen is, of course, very captivating, has an extremely pronounced image, which I'd say fits you if music videos like Digital Witness or any, uh, any proof. But Cruella actually relies on her intelligence and cunning to accomplish her goals. She doesn't need any magic. And oh. is this leading you? Is this spurring some, some uh, thoughts? Oh, I like, I like both of these. When I'm, is, um, is Maleficent the... The Snow White one? Yeah. Or no? Uh, Snow White, yeah. I believe. Is um, that correct? I mean, it's been a minute. Yeah. It's been a minute since I took off the Disney catalog. Um, I buy that. You know what? Yeah. I'll, I, uh, I'll take Cruella. She's, um, she's got mad style. Um, I forgot exactly what evil she does. Is she kills dogs or? <laughs> yeah. So uh, she, she is a dog murderer. Uh, I wouldn't say you share that trait with her, but uh, I have this cool quote that I found that I mm. think kind of goes in line with you. So the quote is in the movie, this vampire bat, this inhuman beast, she ought to be locked up and never released. The world was such a wholesome place until Cruella, Cruella DeVille. And the reason I think this quote is perfect is I feel like bringing it into the music world, I feel like you could interpret it as casual music critics and fans commenting on something maybe they don't quite understand, being offended by something that might be outside their comfort zone. And I, I bet you've dealt with this type of thing 
uh, at some point during your career, everybody kind of does. Um, <laughs> people, yeah, people who crave sure. like that cookie cutter type of uh, image or music and get disoriented by your approach, which has obviously been hugely successful, um, sort of antithesis of, of the norm in some ways. Um, all while looking cool and fashionable and making your making it happen with your ingenuity. Well, thank you. I will. I'll take that, Cruella. Um, I'm not currently wearing dog, but right. you know who knows what the future holds. <laughs> um, no, I mean, yeah, it's a funny thing when you're just you're truly just kind of like doing the music that excites you, and you're like just trying to figure it out and make something that you think is really, um, really good and interests you, and then. Um, a funny i think it's funny to be offended by by music i'm offended when things are cynical mm -hmm. like i'm offended when it sounds like somebody is just uh trying to when someone's like not really being true to themselves or it feels like someone's pandering that that when things are cynical that offends me but other than that no nothing nothing offends me um yeah i'm there there with you. Yeah. So first things first, Annie, I have a couple softball lobs for you. I call this segment Burning Questions. <laughs> These are uh, rapid fire questions, as you can tell by that incendiary fire. Yeah. Uh, these questions don't totally matter, but uh, for some reason, us guitar players want to know these things. So the first question is, what gauge pick do you like to use? Oh, I have one in my hand. I'm playing with it. It is uh this is a uh point six millimeter Dunlop. Nice. I like this pick. I like because it's uh it you can it's good it's good um sort of fast action this, you know, mm -hmm. like almost funk world. But also you can get, especially if you hold it, I hold it like this. I never, I don't, do people still hold the pick like this? So you don't use the pointed end, you use like the rounded side? I never, yeah, I haven't used the pointed end in years, decades. Yeah, but it's this side. And then you just, and the, but it's really, um, I like this one a lot. This is, I've been using this kind of pick now for probably seven or eight years, my go-to. Nice. What yeah. about a uh, string gauge? What's your preferred string gauge? I think I'm tens, but I was actually just thinking last night that I want to have a guitar set up with, with nines and do some like crazy bends. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's your string gauge? So I've actually found my sweet spot after 15, almost 20 years of playing, uh, nine and a halfs. What? Check them out. They're... Wait, is that a standard string size? Uh, I mean, yeah, they, they they make them. They just make them. That's a yeah. normal. Oh, wow. It's it's definitely newer, I would say. Maybe in the last few years I've heard about them. But yeah, nine and a half gauge strings are are my sweet spot. Because I, I like the slinkiness of nines up mm -hmm. in the, you know, beyond the 12th fret. But sometimes with nines, it's hard to, to get intonation perfect with chords down low. So yeah, uh, yeah the nine and a halfs. Um, kind of like a heavy bottom light top sort of thing. It's really oh, great. Oh, that sounds great. Check them out. I'm going to I'm gonna check that out. Um, that's next on my, I mean, I don't have it. The only, I have a, I have a bunch of like weird baritones with like flat wounds and acoustic baritones. I have like piezo pickups and like uh, Nashville tunings and stuff like that. But I don't have just like a regular, well, I tune down a whole step, but like I don't have any like regular standard tuning for me in in a nine mm -hmm. or a nine and a half. So th I'm gonna try that next. Thanks for that hot tip. Yeah, spine deck and nine and a half. So that's the laundry list right now. Mm. Wait, spine deck? Spine deck, this thing. Oh, sorry. I, didn't... <laughs> I, I threw I'm it out right. there like you like you've known about it for years. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, what is your, well, I, I know the answer to this, but maybe you can expound on it just a tiny bit. What's your number one guitar right now? 
Um, my number one is the new is the St. Vincent Goldie. I've Gold. been playing it nonstop. And what is your favorite amp right now? Um, I I've, I've been I've been plugging a lot. I have a console here, and I've just been plugging a lot direct any into the sort console, of, any, any getting like... that sort of like board, very in your face board sound, and like sending it to like an LA two A or something, and just getting like that really aggressive, um, uh, just kind of destroy destroyer sound um and then uh yeah that's been my sort of main go-to and like uh, like outboard like old um like this oh this guild what is it like little tape echoes and stuff from the from the 50 uh from the 60s and 70s and that, that kind of world so i haven't been playing through a lot of amps recently yeah i get it uh, finally, what's your favorite guitar pedal currently? You know what? I just got something. I just got this microcosm pedal. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I ha it's um, I haven't like fully unlocked all of the secrets of it yet, but it is it's very inspiring, I think. Um. It's inspiring. I just maybe someone in the comments can tell me how to MIDI uh, MIDI sync it to Pro Tools. It has a MIDI app in, but I just refuse to read any instructions ever. So <laughs> I'm the, sa I'm the same way. Me. Yeah, it's I like don't the know most why. complex pedal ever. And you're like, I'll figure it out. Let's go. I'll figure it out. Oh my god, exactly. I have modular synths here at my feet that I'm just like, no, 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 I don't need this. I don't I don't need the instructions. Yeah. It takes away from that feeling when you finally do get that sound. You're like, oh, this is it. Yeah, exactly. Wow, look what I did. <laughs> exactly, yeah. All right, let's move on. I have another segment called Name Those Notes. So Are you song. asking me like if I have perfect pitch? That's funny. You, uh, uh, half about half the guests wonder that. Not going to well, test. I'm not going to test your your perfect pitch. Uh, I don't have perfect I pitch, so I wouldn't even know if you're right. But um, do do I know it's a you've got a minor. It's going up a minor third. Yes, a root and a minor third. That is the correct interval. Yeah. Do, 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 do. If I had to guess, I'd say it's around an A. It is, you know an a. What it is? 448. is it an A. Four forty eight. Yes, you have perfect yes. pitch. I have good relative pitch. Relative pitch, but it's yeah. not, I, I do not have perfect pitch. I wonder about people who have perfect perfect pitch because it seems like one of those like a, a cursed <laughs> like you've been cursed with perfect pitch. And any and I mean some people it doesn't they have perfect pitch like my friend Laura Sisk who engineered a lot of the last couple albums like she has perfect pitch but um, it is. It doesn't haunt her the way that it haunts some people. Some people with perfect pitch, their basically music is is most music is unlistenable to them. Yes, I've heard that same thing. Do you have a a song that you reference for your relative pitch? Mine is Megalomaniac by Incubus. It's that open G. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Wait, how does the rest of that song go? I don't uh it's like <laughs> it has a really cool verse part mike einzinger he's a master <laughs> isn't it funny how there's some like the sound that you make like i do the same the sound the same thing near 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 like, like that's syllable? how i would describe the sound of a guitar riff it's these like phonetic things that are the same for some reason yes we are we are straight Dare. And near. We're strange creatures. It's I know. a weird language. So, um, so, so this segment, name those notes. I'm, I'm glad we went on that tangent. That was fun. Uh, I'm going to play you a quick sequence of guitar notes from songs that you have recorded over the years. Oh. And you have to tell me what song that the, these notes come from. So it's sort of like guessing, how, seeing how well you recognize your own guitar playing, and we'll talk about some of your work over the years in the process. Okay. So the first one, we'll start, I think, some, with something you'll get, and we'll get progressively harder. Sound good? Okay. 
Great. Okay. Here's the first one. That's Los Angeles. Yes, it is. And that's me doing my best Fripp. Robert Fripp. Yeah. And that's not, that wasn't a, um, a whammy. That's actually sliding up the frets. Yeah. That's, I, not, that's not a that. I got that sense because it's like, uh, it's very analog, you know, like yeah. authentic right. human sliding. Uh, the guitar tones you got in this section, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, so I was wondering if you recalled that effect setup. So it's basically just an overdriven <laughs> guitar. <laughs> Oh God, I have no, um, God, I wish I remembered, uh, the same way that I don't read instructions. I never take notes and I really should. Um, it's okay. If you don't, you answered the main question, which is that that's not a whammy pedal. It's a slide. No, it's not a whammy pedal, which is cool. No, a lot of people might think that it is. Let's move on to another one. Here we go. That's a song called Regret, which um, always has like a, um, it has such a Zeppelin, there's something very Zeppelin about the chord uh, voicings in that. And I think it's, I think I'd have to ask, this is so embarrassing, I'd have to ask my guitar tech what tuning that's in, but yeah. I think it's in the same tuning as Birth and Reverse, and it's like a, some version of a dip. It's not dad, dad, but it's something. No, it might be E. I think it's an E. And it's like I'm making the chord shape of a, like a major six chord. And the, on the, um, like how you'd make a major six on the middle four strings. Right. I don't, I'd have to, I, it would take me a long time to figure out how to, how I played it or what tuning it was in. But yeah, it has, it always has a very like, um, um, -dun 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 rain song, right? No, rain no, no, song is not rain song. Uh... Rain song is beautiful. I was, I was, I always can, I always say rain song when I mean. Uh, dun -dun 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 -dun. Yeah, this is embarrassing. Yeah. I'm, I should know that, but I don't remember it. Rain song is a. Oh wait, this is in a crazy tuning. <laughs> That's in a crazy tuning. That won't help. Oh, this is in Nashville. Let's see. Oh, this might be in Rain Song though is so beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, there it is. This is all of my loving. It was like a season I felt before. And then it's so beautiful. I love that song. Um, so no, it's not rain song. It's um, is it D D D your maker? Dire I get maker. Zeppelin. Dire maker. Dire maker. We're gonna get killed in the comments. It's okay. I know someone's gonna. Yeah, I. I <laughs> you know what? It's sometimes people will like be like, you don't remember the name of the song. It's like, yeah, I know how to fucking play it though. <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters, <laughs> like, man. I know how to make the yeah, sound come out. Off, I can play it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right, let's move on to another one here. Getting a tiny bit more challenging, but I think we're still all right. Oh, I'm I'm particularly proud of this riff. That's a good riff. I don't, you know, I'm not. I'm trust me, I'm not often like patting myself on the back, but that's a good riff. I do remember putting that through an even tie. That's some crazy filter on an H three thousand. Even tied, um, and that's like that's a again I'm sacrilegious. I'm doing on this guitar, but that's a wait. Oh, it doesn't sound. It sounds weird on a Nashville tuning. Let me see. You know what I mean? It's like. Um, Did you say the yeah. name of the song? Say what? Oh, that's Surgeon. That's the end of Surgeon. Surgeon. And and this the, is actually, I don't know if you noticed, this was taken from a live 
uh, concert I found on YouTube where you actually start the song that way. Because this is technically the chorus riff, right? Yeah. So this and it's it's minor and it's it goes it's a song and it goes to the relative minor for the chorus. Mm -hmm. But all those chords, all the the riff still works over minor or major. Do you change any songs like from the studio to live, or the ones that just were captured a certain way in the studio, and you just totally do them differently live because it doesn't translate or it translates a different way? It's a dance. Like um, Bruce Springsteen said, your job is a um, performer is to, he said, so, I think these are the words he said, like shock and console. So, um, so you're, you do one thing, a, a song that they know a completely different way. And then you do another song, like exactly how people want to hear it, mm -hmm. like exactly how it was recorded. I mean, you know, obviously minor details, you know, changed and with the energy of live, but sometimes you need to just like, give it to the people exactly how they remember it. And I think that's important, you know, not on every song, certainly, because then you, that's, that gets a little dull, but, you know, like I remember going to see um, Steely Dan multiple times when they do their like full albums at the Beacon Theater. And those are, those guitar solos, like I wanted to hear the guitar solo from the Royal Scam exactly the way it was played on the record. You know, they're so, they're like, perfect solos and you don't really want to hear someone like stretch out right you know totally totally there's a anyway. hundred songs it's like i i need to hear the exact like micro bend on this little part to go exactly down to yeah exactly sing it the same way don't don't get creative don't improvise on the melody yeah the melody's great sing it you know i think the first time i ever saw you was yeah. at um uh, Pitchfork Music Festival in like 2013 or 14. Oh, did Chicago. I ram my head into a kick drum? I think you did. Yeah, I remember that show. It was wonderful. <laughs> Got another one here for you. And this was a late edition. <laughs> yeah, I covered Sad But True. And um, I tried to do... For the two like different guitar solo sections, I tried to do one that was like paying homage to Kirk Hammett, and then another that was like, how would I play a solo on this? So one is like kind of me just doing, doing my version of Kirk, and the next one is yeah, like, I, I really love it. Was still yours though, even like the the homage to Kirk, as you mentioned, it was still. Like I, f I heard your fingers in there. It was really a really nice interpretation, and actually, really? just came out today. Uh, I saw <laughs> on your YouTube channel. I was like, "Holy shit, I, this is awesome!" I got to ask her about this because um, I'm pumped to talk about Metallica with you because they're one of my favorite bands ever and massive influence on me. I imagine you too. Um, yeah. It, is "Sad but True" your favorite song? And if not, what is? Um. It's not my favorite. I mean, I have a lot of favorites, so I can't say that it's a, that it is my favorite to the exclusion of other songs. But I will say it's really interesting to go in when you think you know a song and then like learn it and um, and kind of especially digging into the rhythm section. There's like, a lot oh, of intricate okay, this stuff. This is interesting. This is really interesting what they're what they're doing here. Um, uh yeah i mean sad but true is definitely among the favorites um like when i heard when i heard uh master of puppets for the first time it was my life mission to get through all eight minutes of it yeah and it was like my guitar <laughs> workout when i was 15 and ever since could then. you could you play it when you were 15 i mean I think I think I did a pretty good job. You know, when you're ki when you're Amazing. a kid and you get into something, and you know, like you you develop a very specific. Like I was totally a Metallica robot. So uh -huh. between that and like Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and ACDC, that was like my my holy trinity plus one. They would uh, yeah. always be cycling <laughs> one out. But uh, yeah, I, I I did a good job. I don't think I had too much feel like intonation, but the rhythm and, and the, the chops were there. The down picking. 
You know, I had the the James Hetfield down picking, um, which is like harder for me to play now than when I was 15. And I'm just like, I know. how the hell? That's really something I discovered that. And even though Sad But True is, is definitely like more of a swamp stomp and not it's not that. Not but thrash. like, it's like, oh, geez. Yeah. Huh. Huh. Yeah. yeah, no, I, that's very I'm very impressed. And, you know, that it would be uh, feel and like emotion uh, that st- I would be I would be very impressed if you had like feel and emotion down at 15. True, true. Usually people have like no skill, but a lot of emotion and that's messy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's always the balance. Totally. All right. I got, I got one more song for you here. This will be interesting. Okay. That's down. That is down from yeah. the new album, daddy's home. This song is so cool. It's like a mix of, Prince and of Montreal, and maybe like a little Frank Zappa Catholic girls zest thrown on top, <laughs> uh, but it still has the the Saint Vincent style, which is so distinctive. And this is a guitar podcast, so I I have to bring it up. Mm-hmm. These awesome sitar lines and great Ottawa lead parts. Your your guitar approach to this latest album. What would you sum that up as? Because this album does feel a little different than some of your previous ones definitely it's way less angular it's way more um way more feel in in a sort of like it's interesting to talk about it's interesting to talk about music because like there i think it's easy to talk about the technical things in a certain way and it's hard to talk about like the the crazy depth mm. you know the the like the deep um the deep like time feeling and i was way more way more interested in like time and where i placed a note and like the soul of it than the um than the notes sure than the sure. Har- harmonic notes although obviously there are i play a number of notes but um so that was kind of i was like trying to approach everything with a whole lot of uh patience and depth and for those reasons i think it's like uh personally an, an achievement but um it's not as like angular like cut 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 in your in your face it's not as jagged or sort of like demented as some of the other some other stuff that i've done but it was a really like deep exercise for me sorry to sound like a no i get it so that was that was intentional then just kind of rounding out the edges and really paying attention to the because there's a lot of guitar parts happening in that little clip that i played where there's like a little funky maybe like two or three note chordal thing. And then there's the sitar thing going on. And then there's probably Mm -hmm. some other stuff that's very layered in, but overall it it feels scarce and not in a bad way. Like it's just leaving room for what it is you have to say. And um, I think it's great. I really like the whole album. There's a lot of acoustic on it as well. There's a little bit. Yeah. Like starting off songs and like, I feel like that's kind of a newer threshold well, you know, it's, I, it's, it's funny. I had to borrow my friend's like sixties or seventies Martin to, to play like the straight up acoustic parts. Cause I don't, I don't have an acoustic that isn't some like baritone Frankenstein. Yeah. I just, I don't have that. Like, Oh, this is my classic acoustic that I go to. I'm just, I don't have one. Um, so Yeah. Um, I definitely remember tracking it on um, a song, like, the, 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 the um, chorus of a song like Down and Out Downtown and and doing it in not full Mutt Lang style, but playing like two notes at a time mm-hmm. and then playing the next two notes and playing the next two notes um, to just get like a real, a real expansive 
sound to track it like that because it it was it it made just the sound of it better because then you're dealing with not the full raking of the full chord but things chiming kind of all at the same time yeah it definitely speaks to that concept we were talking about like just kind of making everything a little tighter um as a yeah. part so you once said i don't love it when the guitar sounds like a guitar and well, I, I i like that i like that sentiment people i mean people can change tyler <laughs> oh, now you do love it no, when a guitar I, sounds like this, a guitar no, I, in general, for, I mean, for a long time, I was trying to make the guitar sound like anything but a guitar. Uh, but now I'm like, oh, I love the guitar. And um, it's fun to play with some of these idioms and try to, like, speak the language and not be a tourist and really, like, own the guitar in a sort of different way. Do you see, do you feel like that is a product of the guitar kind of coming back around because I feel like, I don't know if you're familiar with this whole notion that the guitar is dead or it's like in the background now, like it had its yeah. time. And then it, I think everything's cyclical. Um, so I think it is coming back in a, in a very interesting and maybe old school way. Then maybe from like 2000 until now it went through that phase where people were trying to mess with the guitar. Like Tom Morello comes to mind. Incubus, again, like the effect yeah. side of things, um, really driving. And then there were the purists on one side who were like, just plug straight into the amp, man. If you can't do it like <laughs> that, then you can't do it at all. Where do you fall on uh, – so it sounds like you've kind of come around along with the rest of guitar society where it's like the guitar is back. Do you have any opinion on this whole topic? Um, I mean, I think part of the, uh, guitar is dead, rock is dead. I think that's been something that's been used to like sell magazines for 50 years. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, you know, like tell, you know, tell the people still like carrying the torch that rock is dead. Like, no, it's not. It's, it, you know, things evolve, of course. Um, I, for me, coming back around to loving the sound of a more literal guitar sound um, was in some ways like kind of paying homage to my roots as a guitar player and kind of going back to where where it all began. And so I don't I, I guess I'm not a purist about anything. You know what I mean? I don't, I'm not orth, orthodox. I don't subscribe to any sort of one orthodox. I'm really like, hey, however you can go and create something that's interesting and expressive, whether that means you're an amazing guitar player who can sit, sit alone with an acoustic and make it sing, like, or whether you have an entire, you know, football field's worth of effects and you use it as a noisemaker and use it as a, more of a rhythmic thing or whatever it is. Charlie Parker, if it sounds good, it is good. That's, that's just. That's the mantra. Yeah. If it sounds good, it is good. Well, hopefully this sounds good. I want to play you something that I created. <laughs> I created this Annie. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were going to play me more of me. I was horrified. Okay, You're done. Go you on. got five out of five. You win. Um, I played this on your guitar and I want to talk about why these notes came out. So here's a little sample. So is, that, that's from is that the intro of a song. That was really cool. That's a great intro. It came, I've been, li I've been listening to your music all week to, to get ready for our chat. And, uh, no surprise. I gravitated towards, you know, despite what we just talked about, I, I still <laughs> gravitated towards like, you know, yeah, it was a whammy. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask you about this guitar because every guitar makes you play a certain way. I mm -hmm. just got acquainted with this one recently, as I mentioned, and that I never would have played that had I not had this guitar. And oh, I'm really, yeah. I'm really, you know, I'm going to explore that more. And I just want to ask you 
this signature guitar, I had, I'm lucky to have a lot of guitars and I've played a lot of signature guitars. This is easily the most unique signature guitar that I've seen, like in a, a massive distribution scale. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you first, we'll talk about some of the cosmetic stuff where I think is, you know, highly unique. Um, where, what, what is this like in your words? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, how, how to eloquently ask. Like there's so many different spots from the headstock to the fret and lays and the shape. Like what, what about this guitar is, is Annie Clark or St. Vincent? What would you say? Oh man. Well, I, I'm, it definitely, it's definitely a new, a new shape in a certain way, but also like I used to for a long time play, harmonies and you know k's and uh silver tones and this kind of like guitars that you used to be able to get at a pawn shop right and they were um or even like the japanese made stuff from the 60s like really cool kind of space age shapes like what people thought the future looked like mm. in the 60s yeah. Yeah. um which is always i always have a soft spot for so it's sort of like an homage to some of the oddness of of those guitars um but it's also a guitar that's like actually plays well and will actually stay in tune and you won't have to like <laughs> tune it in between every song or after a solo and same thing with like the whammy bar it's it's like an it's all the things i loved about those quirky pawn shop guitars but also really a player for for real players um, totally. That's the, uh, you know, the staple of Ernie Ball, Music Man guitars. Do you say Ernie Ball, Music Man, or just Music Man? I always mess this up. Like, do, I don't know. do I call them Music Man? Like, is this a Music Man or is it an Ernie Ball Music Man? We need is it answers. Ernie Ball by Music Man? No. It just no, says that's... Ernie Ball Music Man, but I always say like it's it's it works for them though because it's, their name is so, the longest name in the guitar industry. Really, <laughs> <laughs> Ernie Ball. That's really funny. I don't think I've said it. It, it. It's good if we just uh, make sure all the words are in there. So Ernie Ball Music Band. Yes. Just wonderful, wonderful strings, accessories, and guitars. Um, <laughs> um, so what, what's yeah, but also, I mean, you know, that there is that feeling of like, um, you know, when you pick up a Strat, there's certain like riffs you gravitate toward. Mm -hmm. um, like... I can't pick up a strat without playing um, the first part of like castles made of sand. I was going to say you know little I mean? wing. Yeah. I always no, just exactly. go bam right on the 12th fret. But like, and, and so there is like uh, as much as we try to reinvent, we, we are like, we're building upon the history of the instrument. And that's awesome. Like, there's an amazing history of music made on strats. There's an amazing history of music made on tellies, um, SGs, the list goes on. But I think what was exciting to me is that, well, there we get to make a whole new canon of music for this guitar because there's not that association. I mean, there might be some association with me, but, like, it so transcends me and is absolutely for players to just, like, let's make the new canon. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the new riffs that are going to be, you know, iconic in 40 years? And like, let's make them on this instrument because there's not there's not any baggage in that in that way. Yeah, that's really cool. Having a signature instrument, you can kind of watch it go off like a like a child going off to college. It goes out. Yeah. And it's like, go be great. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely graduate. Yeah. 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 Great. Unless you go to Berkeley, then you don't, then you can win Grammys like Annie. Uh, I, I do have one other question about this. Um, I like to ask this for people who have signature guitars. Do you have a preferred setting where the, the knobs are at, where the pickup selector switch, just when you plug into an amp, dry? Um, right now, I'm pretty obsessed with the middle ah. pickup switch on this guy. We, d we, kinda, we streamlined the electronics in this model. It was like cute and clever the way we did it on the first St. Vincent model. But this is sort of, I realized like if you're in the middle of a song and you're so used to going all the way to the neck or all the way to the bridge, 
on the selector, I don't want people to have to think mm. when they're doing that in the middle of the song. So we just made it more more streamlined, like more obvious as to which which pickup settings are are for which position. But um, it's a wonderful guitar. You should be very thanks. proud of it. I love playing it. Um, it's a fun one. I really, yeah, I really love it, and I, I hope um, I'm just excited to see what people make on it. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. I have a couple more questions and I'll let you get out of here. Mm -hmm. One time you said about playing guitar, you said about a third of the time, I don't know what's going to come out. And I think you were being kind of facetious, but at the same time, uh, I thought, I thought it was such a cool way. Let me, let me dive into this, uh, whether or not it was true. Um, I thought it was a cool way to describe the act of improvising because I feel like no matter what level you're at, technically the same feeling of kind of, letting loose and letting your muscle memory take over or going for some riff you don't necessarily know is going to work out, but who cares? Um, mm -hmm. What what goes through your mind when it comes to improv on the guitar, whether it's live or in the studio? What what are you thinking about? Um, I'm not thinking about anything. Like if I'm really in the zone, that's one of the great things about music when you're really in the zone. There's, there's suddenly like no conscious thought. Mm. Um, you're just riding the wave, but like, um, that is, it's not wholly, it's not wholly wrong. I mean, a lot of times I'm like, I'll reach for something and I, I'm not, I'm not one of those guitar players who is, who knows, um, what things are going to sound like every time they, I don't have, I actually don't have that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have the exact correlation like I know my uncle does, Tuck Andrus, like he obviously knows the thing inside and out, but um, I feel, I do feel like I'm able to be perpetually surprised. Um, but also like, just to kind of be in the moment, I think that's the biggest thing about, that's sort of like, I feel like there are levels of playing and it's it's where like mastery of an instrument, if that's even possible, um, or technique and all these things meet. But the point is to be transcendent. Like the point is to be deeply in the sea and and lost in it in a great way mm. and lost yeah. in your, you know, egoless in yourself and just it's like in the flow in this in this deep way. And uh Part of that is not being afraid to jump to something if you and just, just jump off the cliff and not know if it's going to land. And that's that's exciting to me. There's that's where like the kind of like magic comes from. Definitely agree on that. Uh, I wanted to ask a different question here. You won a Grammy for Best Alternative Music album 2014 with saint vincent the self-titled album you won in 2019 mm -hmm. for best rock song and <laughs> I, I i basically here's my question what is your best tip for songwriting just one tip if you had to give one tip sum up how to be expressive i'll say in in, in a, as a songwriter what would you one say tip. to the people Oh man, one tip. Um, I know you have a master class on songwriting, so just sum that oh, whole geez. thing up in one <laughs> sentence. Um, uh, one tip on songwriting. Don't write things that you think some nameless, faceless person is going to like. Write things that move you. It has to start with you. It has to start with your own pure intention. This is kind of what I was talking about with cynic, cynic, music I find very cynical. Mm -hmm. um, and that that would be music where you know that the person doing it doesn't fully believe in it. You know that they're trying to appeal to what they think somebody maybe somewhere likes or, oh, this style is already very popular. They will, um, they will subvert their own artistry and pander to making something that uh is popular that they think just people will like um and that's what i think is cynical 
that's 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 one of the few things I think is cynical in in songwriting. Like write something that you write something that you are excited by yeah. that really speaks to your inner voice and instincts. And I think that's that's the way to find it. That's great advice. And it also goes the other way. If you find something that you're creating, you don't have to think, oh, this sounds too much like this. I got to change it. Like, I think it's awesome when something I make sounds like Joe Satriani. Like, and someone's like, yeah. that sounds like Joe Satriani. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> He's <laughs> yeah. like the best. Sure. So. <laughs> and also keep writing. Like yeah. the point is if you, if you're, you know, a song goes through so many like ups and downs sometimes they they show up fully formed and you're like thanks yeah. that was easy but most of the time songs are like you know you're fumbling around in the woods for a long time and uh to just write your way through the fear just write your way through it and and i mean i'm sorry i'm giving you more than more than but um and also i think one thing that happens is that uh <laughs> i guess have you seen this film adaptation oh yeah Okay, I just rewatched it. And so there's a scene that I think about all the time where Charlie Kaufman is like sitting there writing and he's like, I, oh, I, sh I should have some coffee before I write. No, no, I, I should have a muffin, banana nut. And he just like, and so all these things that sort of stop you from starting. Yeah. But if you can just push through those and not judge what's coming out and just be generative, just write and write and write you can write your way through it. You can figure it out. But what you can't figure figure anything out is if you have no material because you are too scared to start. Awesome. So finally, Annie, to loop in your guitar supervillain alter ego, Cruella DeVille, <laughs> I have one final question for you. What do you believe about guitar that most guitar players would think is crazy? This could be a hard truth that guitar players need to hear or something you know that others don't or maybe a misconception about the instrument or whatever you want. You can get mm. on your soapbox. This is a safe space. Oh, wow. Okay. Say whatever you think the guitar players out there need to hear. Yeah. Um, I, would, I think I'd just double down and say it's about how expressive you can be and not necessarily how fast you can play although if those things aid you in expression that's rad um I, yeah i think it's i think guitar playing is about having your own voice as a guitar player and you don't it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're the most um technically gifted although it absolutely can be you know people like my favorite guitar players are people like Fripp or Mark Rebo, who you can tell there's an incredible amount of technique in there, but they're also able to like throw it away and make things that are truly not throw it away, use it, but also use it with enough abandon mm -hmm. to where they make things that are like, whoa, that I, you have me on the edge of my seat. Like what is that is like so exciting whatever you just did was dangerous. Like that, that's so exciting. I'd say to guitar players, like be dangerous. Fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> that's the best way to end it. Great insight yeah. right there. Uh, so Annie, as we wind down here, I'd like to thank you for taking your time to be on guitar villains. It's been a yeah. great privilege to talk to you and I'll look forward to seeing what treacherous plots you devise next in your musical <laughs> endeavors. <laughs> I like this Cruella thing. I might run with that. Who knows? That'll be my next uh, alter ego. Is <laughs> if, if there's an appearance in, in the music video to come, uh, I'll just I'll look at that and be like, yeah, I know where that uh, came yeah. from. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you for that.